I'm going to welcome everybody um, to today's um, workshop, which has been organized by the um, uh, OPD partnership working group, although I can still aware that a lot of people are still joining. But if we don't make a start with at least the welcomes, um, we're going to, to run out of time. So my name's Jas Shaban. I'm one of the co-coordinators of the uh, OPD partnership task team. Um, my colleague, um, Marik. Um, now I'm going to completely ruin your, your, your the pronunciation of your surname. So I'm going to say Boris Um is going to be, uh, who's from the um, community uh, intervention um, task team. He's going to be uh, moderating and uh, we greatly together welcome everyone to this um, uh, workshop where, uh, looking specifically at um, um, participate space. So I'm just going to start with just a, a few little bits of housekeeping before we move into the, the main discussion. So please do note that this uh, session is being recorded um, and will be uploaded onto the IDD, whatever that is, YouTube channel, um, after this session. Um, there will be captioning and ISL interpretation. Uh, um, that's going to be happening throughout. The link to the captions has been inserted into the chat box. Um, so you just click on that and uh, it will come up in a separate window. Um, so we do want this to be a very interactive session. Um, uh, quite alongside the, the discussion from our, our, our panellists. So please post any questions you have in the chat box. Um, and if there is any clarification needed, I will call out. Um, please do add your name and your organisation in the chat box, uh, in the chat box when you're uh, um, adding questions, because obviously uh, that helps us kind of identify um, kind of the context, I suppose, for the question. So that's great. Um, and that's also useful for the recording and also for the reporting afterwards. Uh, if you do need to intervene during the round table, please do use the raise hand icon. Um, uh, I will just um, put a note again in the chat box and the moderator and myself will give you the floor. Okay, so that's all the housekeeping sorted out. So I'm going to pass on to uh, Marik uh, to take us through um, what I hope will be a lively discussion. Thanks very much, Marie. Thank you, Jess, and uh, welcome everybody. We are happy to have you in, uh, it looks good numbers uh, present at uh, this webinar. Um, I would like to start with a thank you to two other people. Uh, you've, you've seen Jazz already, who has been part of the organization of this webinar. Uh, there's two other people. Ruby um, is present today. She has also put a lot of work into the organization of this webinar. And uh, Karen, uh, who is uh, part also uh, CBID task force together with myself. So this is a... Um, webinar organized both by the DPO task group as well as the CBID uh, task group. Um, so I'm hap very happy to be with you all. Uh, for those who didn't catch it yet, my name is Marike Boersma um, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the um, CBID task group. Um, the topic of civic space uh, is an important uh, topic to both of our task groups. And um, we both, uh, both of the task groups, not we both people felt that it would be important to uh, um, share with you examples from people uh, in the field. And I think we managed quite an exciting combination of people from uh, uh, different corners of the world. And uh, a special thank you to uh, our participant from Fiji, uh, for who it is already past 10 in the evening and who is joining us today. Uh, so we're very happy to uh, be able to give you uh, 
uh, a glimpse into um, what is happening around participation in the civic space uh, from different corners of the world. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to that. Um, we, I'm, I'm not, I can't see at the moment uh, of people coming in. We have invited four speakers to this forum and I haven't seen one of our speakers coming in yet. I will introduce her if um, uh, she uh, does not uh, manage to connect. We have already uh, decided how we are going to uh, take care of us, uh, that amongst the other uh, three speakers. So um, the four speakers will give a, a bigger introduction uh, uh, of themselves in a bit. Uh, I'm just going to uh, introduce the names and where they're from, and then uh, they will each have around four minutes uh, to introduce to themselves. After that, uh, we will uh, let them present um, some of their uh, experiences through uh, some questions. And after that, there will be space for you to, uh, to interact with our uh, speakers and uh, with each others, uh, which, with each other, sorry, through questions. Um, so I'm very happy uh, to uh, introduce uh, our speakers to you. Setareki uh, Mat. Tanawi is from um, uh, the Pacific Disability Forum and based in Fiji. Uh, we hope that Pratima Gurung will still uh, join us from the Indigenous Persons with Disability Global Network uh, in Nepal. Uh, we have Agustino Lado from the South Sudan Union of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, and we have Deborah Leo from Civicus based in South Africa. So um, I will give the floor now to you and uh, let's do it in the same order as I uh, announce you now. So uh, please, Seta, will you introduce yourself uh, in about four minutes time? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Marika. I hope I'm coming out uh, clearly through the, uh, this uh, platform. Very clear. Uh, from, from Fiji, uh, as Marika said, Setareki Madanoi is my name, or Seta for short. And I work with um, uh, the Pacific Disability Forum as uh, CEO uh, for a little over 10 years now. And uh, the also want to thank uh, the, the organizers, uh, IDDC, and particularly the, the groups, the two groups that are responsible for this particular session. Uh, we are a regional disabled people's organization, DPO or OPD, uh, working across 20, about 22 Pacific Island countries, uh, the US territories and the French Pacific territories in this region. Uh, membership of about uh, 70 uh, uh, members, a majority of which are organizations of persons with disabilities. Um, both uh, these two are uh, the uh, the, the organizers of this particular session, we, we do uh, identify with with uh, the two groups uh, within IDDC in terms of CBID, Community Based Inclusive Development. We've uh, set up the Pacific uh, CBID Regional uh, Forum, uh, and also, of course, as being a regional OPD organization in the Pacific, our focus on capacity building of organizations and the services that we do provide. We do work closely with the CBM, uh, an IDDC member in our region, uh, both New Zealand and Australia. This topic is very, uh, very uh, close to our to our work, uh, to our hearts. I was going to say as well, in terms of disability inclusion, for our work to succeed, we need to be working with our partners, and in this space, the civil society space. We are hearing about it, we've seen it, it is definitely shrinking. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a good topic for us to, uh, to be talking on and share our experience uh, this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seta, uh, for this introduction and for setting the scene. Um, Augustino, will you come next in introducing yourself? Thank you very much, Marin. Uh, I cannot repeat 
when I say her name exactly. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm glad to be a part of this uh, platform. Uh, my name is Agustina Udri Lario, the chairperson of South Sudan uh, Union of Persons with Disabilities. A South Sudan Union of Persons with Disabilities is still, uh, I think, almost one year. Uh, it was established in uh, 2016, and it was registered as a legal entity in 2012. Uh, it is a, it is made up of eight uh, OPD organizations of persons with disabilities uh, who are based here in Juba. However, we are also uh, looking forward to bringing the other uh, OPDs from the states. Uh, in fact, we uh, working in collaboration with uh, uh, partners like Light, for example, Light for the World and uh, CBM uh, and, and uh, Humanity and Inclusion. And these are some of the organizations that we are working together. In fact, we are trying, a, of course, we are still a, a starting, a, we are still in, 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 in square one, and we are working hard to. To, to, to influence or to, to empower our, our OPDs to advocate for their rights, for their inclusion, the full inclusion in a civic space and also in any public arena. And of course, we, we in South Sudan, we are still behind. We have a lot of good, there is a, a, a lot of, of, of a negative attitude towards people with disabilities. So these are the areas that we are working uh, on awareness, raising that to remove these barriers so that people with disabilities are also uh, uh, given full participation in, 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 in the civic space and also in the public arena uh, as any person in, in the society. So this is what we, uh, this is the role of the, D, of the DPOs to, to, to it is a caring awareness raising also to empower. Uh, this is a brief about uh, South Sudan Union of Persons with Disabilities. Thank you very much, uh, Augustino. Great to hear. And I think that's one of the nice things of this group. We have a very new and uh, new groups and experience of engaging uh, uh, freshly in this uh, civic space and people who have um, done so for many, many years. So I would like to move on to uh, Deborah. Please introduce yourself. Hi, um, good afternoon or evening or morning, everyone. So my name is Deborah Leo. I work as a researcher at Civicus, which is a membership alliance with um, more than 9,000 members in around 175 countries. Um, our membership is made up of organizations and individuals that are committed to strengthening civic participation in civil society um, around the world. And as part of that mandate to promote the space for civil society, we produce research on the trends and developments affecting civic space. Um, so our key program for this is Civicus Monitor, which is where I particularly work. Um, it's a dynamic online tool that draws information directly from our members um, and partners around the world in 196 countries. So our goal is to share reliable, up-to-date data on the state of civil society freedoms in all countries and provide a basis for comparison for the situation between them which we believe allows us to learn about the ways in which our right to participate um, is being either realized or challenged. So this allows us, for instance, to draw attention to countries where there is a serious or rapid decline in respect for civic space and create campaigns and programs to support human rights defenders in countries um, around the world. So while our, our work is really focused on international advocacy, it's grounded on the demands from our members. So in my case, for instance, I focus on research um, and advocacy in the countries in the Americas. In the past months, um, one example of work that we've done is working with organizations in Nicaragua to produce report on the restrictive laws that were passed, especially at the end of last year, and the harassment that journalists, activists, dissidents have faced for the past three years. 
So we use this kind of research, for instance, to advocate for a resolution um, at the Human Rights Council to support closer monitoring of the human rights crisis there. And we also worked with local so society um, and lawyers, in particular families of political prisoners, to highlight cases of persons who have been in prison for their activism. Um, so for instance, we created a campaign called Stand As My Witness that you can all look for, um, it's still ongoing, but it advocates for the release of political prisoners and also calls attention to the situation that they face in multiple countries, especially in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is just an example of our work around this space. We also run several different programs aimed to support human rights defenders, for instance, in Central America by providing them with um, training on security, building resilience, and um, advocating and campaigning for their rights. Um, and so this is just a sample of what we do. And later I'll present a little bit of the findings that we've had around how civic space in, around the world is being respected or challenged. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. Uh, as I said, quite a, a, a variety of people and a variety of experience. So I'm really looking forward to your presentation in a few minutes. Uh, I've seen that Pratima is with us. Welcome, Pratima. Would you be kind to introduce yourself as well? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. So good afternoon and I don't know, good evening and good morning to all of my friends over here. So I'm very much thankful for IDC, IDDC for providing this opportunity. I am Pratima Gurung and I work for uh, indigenous people with disabilities in my country. And I do work at the regional and global level. Uh, right now I represent uh, the national organization called National Indigenous Disabled Women Association of Nepal, and which works for young indigenous women uh, with disabilities. And for me in, the, to, in today's uh, event, I'm uh, uh, asked and suggested to um, uh, present more about the, the challenges uh, and, and the perspectives from an intersectional lens. So I would be highlighting some of the focus uh, on those areas because we work on indigenous uh, person with disabilities who comprise of 54 million indigenous people, 28 million indigenous women with disabilities all around the globe and 1.3 million indigenous people with disabilities in my country. So when it comes to uh, people with disabilities, we know that people with disabilities face discriminations both in various forms, both at public and private sphere. And when, when these uh, realities and, and struggles are again added from um, gender and genius or ethnic identity, it forms, uh, uh, it, it further aggravates the compounded form and, and the result of isolation, marginalization and exclusion for indigenous persons with disabilities having multiple identity. So having known about these realities, we work on the most marginalized group is, uh, is uh, underrepresented groups at the, at the grassroots level and national level, and also at the global level. And when we talk about how do we work on the grassroots level, we, one of the things that we highlight is about the inclusion, intersectionality and human rights based approach is one of our fundamental core that we have been highlighting and we work with a different constituency. At the national level, we work with youth and disability, indigenous and women constituency. So primarily we work with four uh, constituency and also with the different CSOs. And we try to bring the lens of uh, inclusion, disability, intercultural perspective and gender perspective. This is how we have been working uh, at the grassroots level and that grassroots level is again further linked at the global level. So when it comes to uh, our work uh, uh, within the disability constituency, I would just like to highlight some of the few things and then, uh, then th that can be further added in the next presentation. So one of the realities that we have so far faced from our brothers and sisters and within the disability movement and constituency that most often we as indigenous women with disabilities, we are almost and most often we are told that we need to demand our rights 
we need to demand our space within the indigenous movement. So this is what we have been uh, uh, requested by the disability movement and constituency and vice versa. This happens in, in our day-to-day -day lives. So when, when this kind of challenges are, are um, uh, faced in, the, in, 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 in our day-to-day -day realities as indigenous persons with disabilities, we are also trying to work uh, to, to frame our narratives and to look for a different kind of paradigm shift because we know that we are person with disabilities and person with disabilities are not homogeneous group. And when we look at disability, disability is a diverse, it's a complex, sensitive and evolving concept. But for us as a groups who have multiple and intersecting identities, we are still questioning and we are looking at these statements that where are these statements framed for whom and who have we related these statements and when. So for us, it is very time to rethink about what, what kind of work have we done so far. If we look at the national policies uh, that are framed at the national level, we see the, the national policies are framed in a very monolithic. It is framed in a single linear approach that does not address the heterogeneity and the diversity of disability. So I will just pause here and, and we can have further conversation in the next, uh, 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 what do you say, in the next um, question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pratima, and thank you also for setting that scene and adding in the uh, diversity and intersectionality. Thanks a lot. Um, so now that we know our uh, speakers, I uh, would like to move back to uh, Deborah and uh, ask you, I know you prepare the presentation, uh, to tell us a bit about uh, Civicus and um, what is the state of the civic space today? And do you have any examples of it? So uh, Deborah, over to you. All right, I think you should be able to see my screen now. Um, so, yes. yeah, okay, good. Um, so before I go into the details of our findings about civic space, I think what's important is um, to highlight that for those who are not familiar with the Civicus Monitor, again- Sorry, Deborah, we now, we now mainly see your notes and uh, not so much a presentation anymore. Uh, sorry about that. Let me see if I can Let's share. Yeah, oh, okay. All right. Okay. So our research is a, a collaboration between around 20 part research partners that are regional uh, organizations that then work with local, um, national, and, and international organizations to collect data on civic space in the different countries that um, we cover. Uh, and as I said, we are a dynamic online tool. We provide um, information that comes from these variety of sources, but it is important to say that we put the greatest weight on the sources that come from local and national level, because we believe that these are the people who best know the situation of civic space in their countries. Um, so I don't know why. So what is it that we monitor exactly? Um, we monitor the, um, what we call civic space, the freedoms of assembly, um, of association and expression, underpinned by the state's duty to protect these freedoms. And so that's what our definition of civic space is. And we create a rating system through which each country is put into one of five categories. Open being the countries where this, the civic space um, freedoms are best respected, then narrow, obstructed, repressed, and closed. So what have we found, right? Unfortunately, the research that we've um, conducted in the past few years has shown that um, civic space is actually declining around the world. As you um, know, a lot of the people in the world, around 87% live in countries that we 
um, right as closed, repressed or obstructed. What that means is basically that their ability to organize, to speak out, to fight for their rights um, faces severe restrictions. Conversely, it means that only 3.4% of people um, live in countries that have open zone space where their freedoms are mostly respected. Um, and so in the past year, in the past two years really, um, we can't really talk about civic space without talking about protests. Um, and what we see is people taking to the streets in Nigeria, Belarus, the US, um, around the world to demand change, right? But as they've done so, we found that governments have acted often to restrict these rights to protest. And so in the past year, uh, the violation of civic freedom that we most frequently documented was protesters being detained, which together with excessive use of force, meaning tear gas, um, sometimes even use of lethal force to disrupt protests, have been the most common tactics used by governments to restrict the right to peaceful assembly. And on the other hand, this is part of a bigger context where we see states acting more and more to silence dissent. And so among the most common violations that we've, we've recorded has been, for instance, harassment and intimidation, which are tactics often used to silence activists and journalists and others, um, speaking out on issues like corruption, environmental degradation, um, and political persecution. Censorship, which um, in 2019 was the top violation we recorded, and last year was the third top. Um, attacks on detention of journalists, and the detention of human rights defenders as well, as well as restrictive laws, which um, affect all of these different freedoms. Um, we also know that this is actually an uneven crisis because um, although everyone is affected by shrinking civic space, we know that the people on the ground, especially those protesting, are the ones most often affected by restrictions. Journalists are also um, among the, those that are very commonly targeted. And we also know that certain groups face more restrictions or face um, bigger challenges when trying to ex exercise their rights in the different regions. So women have been among the forefront of both the, the people fighting for rights, but also those who face violations, especially for instance on online harassment, but also of course other types of violations. Um, it, oh, it depends a lot on the region, but for instance, in the Americas, environmental groups, and the indigenous people have been among the groups that we've seen very commonly targeted as well. Um, people fighting for labor rights, especially in Europe and Central Asia, um, and people who defend LGBTQI plus rights, and youth in many different countries. So to be frank with you, when it comes to people with disabilities, our research um, still has a long way to go. Where we've most frequently recorded um, people with disabilities and restrictions to civic space or challenges related to civic space have been individuals, often the individuals protesting. So for example, um, in El Salvador, we recorded groups of veterans with disabilities protesting against um, and speaking up about the fact that they have experienced um, the civil war and they believe that peace and democracy is, the, is something that they need to defend. So we've seen groups coming up. We've also seen individual activists being um, affected by restrictions. So just last month, for instance, in the UK, uh, we recorded the case of a young teenager with learning disabilities protesting against the police though in the UK who was, um, despite the fact that she identified herself as somebody with a disability, was mistreated by police, who used excessive force um, to detain her. So we've, we've recorded some individual cases, and in the case of this photo, for instance, we know that there have been some cases where organizations representing people with disabilities and people with disabilities have faced specific challenges. So for instance, in Poland in 2018, um, people, um, especially parents of children with disability, but also children with disability, occupied parliament for over a month. But during that month, authorities acted to restrict the protests as much as they could, not only by um, 
restricting access to the bathroom within the parliament because they were um, staging a sit-in, but also by restricting, for instance, the access of children's physiotherapists um, to the protest as well. So while we know that there are different um, aspects that we still need to develop research on this, I think it is very important to have this kind of conversation that we're having now because it is clear that uh, we still need to learn a bit more and develop a more intersectional lens when um, producing research on sacred space. Um, but finally, before I go, even though our findings and our top headlines paint a somewhat bleak picture, I would say that actually this is a story of hope. Um, because what we've seen in the past two years is also that people who have taken to the streets and people who have spoken up about issues that um, they care with about and, and about their rights have been able to move things toward change in the past two years. We had some examples within the monitor that we um, recorded, for instance, Chile just now had um, the election for the Constitutional Assembly, which was a direct result of the mass protests in 2019. We saw um, Black Lives Matter in the US and different countries, and we've seen people being incredibly resilient, even in face of um, very strong restrictions. And so before I close the presentation, I just want to say that actually, this is a story of how civil society has continued to resist despite the shrinking civil space. And I hope that this is a good way to set up our conversation coming up. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, thanks for setting the scene and setting um, uh, our scene. Uh, we uh, in IDDC usually talk about uh, disability specifically, but it's really great to set that within the global scene of civic space. And I already saw in the comment, thanks for the very nice pictures in the presentations to reflect that. Uh, so thanks a lot. Um, I would like to move on to Augustino. Uh, and Augustino. Christina, I would like to ask you, uh, so your um, network of organizations of people with disabilities is um, quite new. You are one year old. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you're also living in the newest country in the world. I yes. might have missed another new country, but I don't <laughs> think so. And uh, I would like to ask you, um, how have you gone uh, about energizing the network? of uh, di diverse organizations with persons with disability to collectively get involved in the civic space alongside other social justice movements to influence your government. The floor is yours, Agustino. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, uh, as I've already uh, put it, uh, in fact, a civic space uh, for us in South Sudan is still very, very narrow. Uh, however, uh, the realization of, of, of the rights of people with disabilities and their involvement in, in, the civic, in, in the civic space are the component of our ad advocacy program. Uh, we have, in fact, done uh, a number of uh, awareness uh, raising campaign in collaboration uh, with our partners here in Juba uh, to strengthen uh, the, the involvement or the network of our OPDs uh, alongside with the other social uh, justice uh, actors. Uh, to influence the government uh, to ratify uh, the regional and, and the international uh, 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 protocols on the rights of people with disabilities and also uh, to implement our domestic uh, policies to ensure the full uh, involvement of persons with disabilities 
in decision making and participation in all uh, spheres uh, of life as enshrined in the international protocols. Uh, in fact, like uh, 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 it's also as like uh, it's already a, a, the, the, the sustainable development goals agenda that no one is left behind. Uh, in fact, uh, still it is, it is a challenger of us. However, we manage uh, to influence our daily working. Now, uh, we have realized that there are some changes and uh, we are now involved in a civic space arena. However, we have a lot still to do because most of our, of our OPDs are based here in Cuba. And then we need to see that uh, the OPDs that are coming up in the States are also uh, strengthened so that they can uh, also work alongside with the social justice actors to influence the, the state government for the realization of a full in, uh, involvement in civic space and, and even the public arena as any citizen uh, in South Sudan. Uh, in fact, uh, we are working closely with the partners, as I mentioned before, uh, here in South Sudan, and also uh, uh, with the other civic, uh, the social justice actors, uh, for example, like uh, uh, Safe for which is uh, the, 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 the Community Empowerment Progress Organization, and uh, it's also for that. Uh, the foundation for, uh, for 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 democracy and account and, and uh, accountable uh, governance. Uh, these are the social actors that we are working close with them, so that we, at the end of the day, may uh, be involved fully in a civic space. Uh, this is a brief what I can. I can show. Anyway, we have realized some changes than before. That people with disabilities are now uh, somehow involved and are able also to 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 to, to air out the, their grievances. And the community is now uh, starting to realize their participation and uh, decision making. Uh, of course, sometimes make people with disabilities, their potential we are not realized. But now with the coming of our DPOs, people have realized that a persons with disabilities have a, a potential when they are given a space and they and, and opportunities to participate. So uh, this is what we have done. And we are still working a lot to see that people with disabilities are fully involved in a civic space and, uh, and decision making. And also their participation in, in, in all aspects of life like any citizen in the country. So uh, this is briefly what uh, I, can, I can tell you. I don't know whether I've answered you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Agustino. And thank you for sharing uh, these experiences from South Sudan. I especially like the way you highlighted that 
entering the civic space needs both uh, the understanding of the space you're entering, but also the confidence, empowerment of, uh, in this case, people with disabilities to know that they can and have the capacity to enter that space. So thank you very much for sharing your experiences. I was just wondering, Seta, would you like to add anything on the same question from uh, your um, uh, quite longer, slightly longer, would not quite mention it, experience this from Fiji in one or two minutes. Yes, um, I think the, 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 the key Augustino mentioned uh, for person disabilities or their representatives the work has to be done within first. Um, person with disabilities, uh, the, the capacity needs to be developed. They need to be confident. They need to be informed. They need to be empowered. Uh, and uh, to, to be able to participate uh, effectively and represent the, uh, the, the issues alongside other civil society in, in advocating to governments. And that's something that uh, we are currently, we have been, we continue to work with our members um, in, in, the, in, the, in, in, uh, in the Pacific. The, um, the, uh, the, 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 the realization that with disabilities, we are, we are, we are, don't live in isolation. We are part of a society, part of a community. And our issues, our fight, our battles need not to be ours alone. Recognizing that, acknowledging that, and then equipping ourselves appropriate, appropriately, will then um, be able to to, uh, to equip us with with uh, the right tools to then engage. Because for for many reasons, uh, persons with disabilities may not have the, the the education background, may not have uh, uh, undergone the training, but one thing that they need to know to, uh, to, uh, to value is their own lived experience on, on, uh, as individuals and taking that to, to, to that space. Uh, and I think uh, and my other point is still, it's still in the same vein in issues, uh, areas where persons with disabilities, how do the, uh, the representative of the collective, uh, the disability movement, there would be, say, persons with vision impairment or physical uh, disability speaking, representing the disability community. They, they are, they are the, the, and it's a skill, it is um, experience how to, to make sure that when there is that one opportunity, you're actually representing the, the collective voice. And that too can be very difficult. In, in, in this context. So I think it, it's acknowledging that, uh, that there are needs, capacity needs to be built for, for person with disability to be able to participate effectively and confidently. And also the need for them to maintain that united front because opportunities uh, do not, um, are minimal. And when there is an opportunity to uh, gain traction, to advocate, making sure that it's the representative voice of person disabilities. So it's actually all human rights of all person disabilities in that uh, opportunity. That would be my addition. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Seta. Um, some very good uh, additions and experiences. I liked especially um, your sentence uh, to recognize that the fight does not to need to be ours alone. Uh, thanks a lot for these additions. I would like to move on to uh, Pratima. Uh, and Pratima, would you uh, be able to share with us, uh, um, based on your experience on working in the intersectionality, you already raised it in your introduction, what do you consider to be risks and challenges when working with the disability movement in coalition with other social justice movement actors? So Pratima. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question again. So for me, uh, from an individual level and uh, from an institution level, I would say that working on intersectional and multiple groups, the first challenge that we have is within our constituency. 
And uh, when I say within our constituency, I would like to frame that is further again divided in two parts. First is a, is a individual level where a person with disabilities, including women with disabilities or, in, or indiz, indigenous people or LGBTIQ uh, with disabilities themselves do not understand about the overlapping and multiple and intersecting identities they have or they possess. They even do not know about the impact, the various types of impact in their uh, daily lives. They're not able to articulate their identities and, and they even do not know what does that mean in their lives. So this is one of the challenges at the individual level. But at the same time, we have also the other challenge that is related within our own constituency. For example, if you take the context of Nepal, the issue of indigenous people with disabilities is not a, still accepted as a, as a human right issue or as a rights of person with disabilities in the context of Nepal. So that is one of the challenges that we have. And when it looks to other different, I see the same kind of challenges. For Bangladesh, we have the majority of indigenous people with disabilities and they are still not recognized by the state. So that is the kind of, uh, challenges that we face within our own constituency. But at the same time, we also have a challenges working with the different CSOs and working with the other constituency like the women constituency, the indigenous youth and other CSOs. Because most often we find that the narratives of marginalization is mostly framed by people who are in the power. So the power is one of the very uh, predominant identity and predominant space that matters that who is holding the power to whom. And when it comes to groups like multiple and intersecting identities, the, 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 the use of power is very much limited. And, and, and as a result, we see that there is limited participation of those underrepresented groups. So these are the kind of challenges that we, are, we have so far been facing as, as a groups with multiple and intersecting identities. But however, having said all these challenges, I would also like to highlight that we also do have the opportunities sometimes. And if we, if we can use these limited opportunities that we have as a multiple and intersecting identities, we can say, and, and we have proved that we can influence the, uh, the different movements and different CSOs. And this is what we have so far done at the national level to the global level. We have been able to influence the cross movement collaboration, build allies and networks within the different constituency. And for that, we have been continuously being very loud and proud. We are proud of what we have and we are accepting and we are acknowledging and ad admitting our identity as an indigenous person with disabilities within the disability, within the indigenous and within the other Shia souls movement. And that has, uh, that has opened the avenues for us that today we are not able to only highlight ourselves as a vulnerable group, as a marginalized group, but we have also provided solutions. We have also paved the ways that we are contributors in the society that we live and in the family that we live. So that is why we, are, we, have, we have framed those narratives. And for that, what we have so far done at the, at the national the global level is uh, we have been vocal, we have been very much a strategic and not all the strategies works for all the constituency. And this is what we have uh, seen. So we have applied different kinds of strategies and different kinds of uh, uh, methods in, in, in doing our advocacy from global to the uh, national level at the grassroots level. And in that regard, I would also like to highlight that meaningful participation and respect for the diversity of all persons with disabilities is very much crucial. The second thing that I would like to emphasize is about the respect of individual and collective rights. When it comes to indigenous people, sometimes our identities are overlapped and sometimes we feel that we are nowhere. And that is why we urge all our brothers and sisters, all our allies and also the constituency to respect the both the individual and collective rights and also frame them in a very intersectional manner so that we can reach the most marginalized group, including indigenous persons with disabilities and 
frame the, the narratives of inclusion, leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pratima. Uh, I can hear from you that you uh, are you have many years of activity and I, I love the way you're speaking about uh, this issue. Um, I'm going to break our flow a little bit because I have the feeling that this is a very nice uh, flow on to uh, SETA, uh, especially because you made the nice shift in, uh, from the challenges to the opportunity. So SETA, would you mind um, coming in again and um, sharing the opportunities that you have seen in uh, the work you've done in Fiji and especially in working in coalition with uh, other social justice movement actors. Okay, uh, yes. Um... Uh, yes, uh, well, thank you, uh, Pratima, for sharing, uh, as you always, the uh, intersectionality and the multiple identity of a uh, person with disabilities when cut, cut to cut across to gender, to uh, uh, indigenous, and the work that you do there in Nepal. Opportunity, yes, certainly, um, for, for us, and, and I and I hear this question, my mind went back to when we first started uh, the work in, the, in Fiji and in the Pacific, where in, in trying to, um, in, in addition, they were forming um, SDG, developing or discussing SDG, um, the, and those open forum. And even prior to that, uh, when we talk about in our case, the small islands developing states, those discussions in those conversations, where, where disability is not, well, until uh, lately, uh, became a, a stakeholder group. So uh, of, of person disabilities and, uh, and one of the major groups uh, in working with the UN. In those spaces where we are not represented, when we do not have a seat at the table, this is the business of alliance building. Uh, how do we then uh, get allies on board that uh, are at those spaces where we are not? So, and, and that's how we we uh, the experience I've had in uh, in working with with uh, uh, with, with uh, our, our partners largely mainstream society in, in growing the work on uh, the disability inclusion, the recognition of rights of persons with disabilities, even way back in the, in the 1990s, 1990s in this region. Uh, it was a, a not, it's a very new phenomenon. Uh, persons with disabilities are largely invisible and, 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 and the, I was talking about the fight, the battle, all the, already at uh, an unlevel playing field. It's already, uh, uh, Pratima talks about the, the balance of the power, the balance of power. So coming into that space, we, we just have to um, navigate the space uh, with a lot of wisdom. Uh, and, and also uh, the opportunity also to, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to realize that we, if we cannot go to the end, there may be an opportunity to meet in the middle. So we we have uh, then uh, big key allies, uh, largely interestingly the uh, the women's uh, groups. Because there, as you know, there's a women's major group. There's an NGO major group. So we uh, the work that we uh, we did in the in the regions largely uh, with other other NGOs and asked them. To be our voice when they're at the table, when they're talking to governments in the region. We attend their meetings, we are part of their mechanism. And in doing that, it rubs off um, as an emerging group, as something, uh, somebody new to that field. You get to learn, you get to see, you get to hear how to, to operate uh, safely, 
uh, successfully, effectively in those kind of spaces. So the opportunity for me, I've just uh, then a fast forward, uh, probably end of last year, uh, uh, I, 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 I uh, perceived disability forum, uh, and myself as focal point, uh, the, uh, was a focal point of a Pacific Regional NGO Alliance platform. Uh, all uh, the regional NGOs that do that address very different issues: women, economy, uh, sort of gender, environment, the church, um, you name it. The, the, the trade unions, education, and to be able to be rubbing shoulders with those leaders, and then asking them. Uh, uh, again, the, 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 the issue of um, the twin track approach, the mainstreaming, for them to include in their work issue disabilities, to share the load uh, as earlier, this fight need not to be ours alone as DPOs, as OPDs. So it's navigating the space safely. And, 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 and what I found that that has really helped. Um, for us, an organization based in Fiji, when we go to different countries, we connect our newly Established, but well, that's often the reality. OPDs are often the, the one of the newer emerging groups that may be forming as a organized group in in a, in a country. The help for them is available in that country, and usually from other NGOs. So we connect those dots, we encourage them to build alliance with 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 their allies, um, because the, the, as I said, the, they could be well assisted supported by their own uh, peers who uh, they may be related to. They talk the same language, the same culture. And that's, that's, that's how I think we, we managed to, to, to grow in the region in the work that we do here, but also to, to, to gain traction into the work. Uh, I talked about SDGL and I'll finish um, here. We were not allowed in some of those spaces. I uh, talked about the small and developing states because we don't have actually a place at the table. So we talked to the indigenous group, we talked to the NGO group, we talked to the youth group, we talked to the women's group. Uh, if we could uh, be sharing their space at those tables. And that's where, that's how we were able to, to get our points through. That's for, for, for it from me for now, Marika. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seta, uh, for these experiences experiences and um, making sure you're there uh, sounds like an important message uh, to me and if you're not there making sure you get the opportunity there through others um, would like to give the space uh, before we go into answering the questions uh, first to uh, Deborah and then to uh, Augustino to give a shorter reaction on uh, the two presentations we had now from Seta and uh, Pratima. And as I give the word to Deborah, um, go ahead. I've seen some questions already. Post your questions in the chat so that we can start um, the discussion after that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for this. I think um, very similar to what. Uh, um, Others have said, and said what I was saying. Um, and previously, before joining Civic, as I worked on youth advocacy in Brazil, um, and the ways that we found to work um, in areas where we didn't have too much um, expertise were, for instance, partnering and working in coalition was probably the strongest way to do it. So, for instance, um, as a youth group, we wanted to advocate for protection of environmental rights and, and um, for policies on climate change. And we had no expertise on litigation, for instance. So we partnered with lawyers organizations, particularly human rights lawyers organizations, um, and also environmental groups to create um, basically a legal case. Um, much like in other countries where young people sue the state um, for the protection of, of the environment and for the adoption of stronger climate policies. And so working in coalition for me has been um, the strongest way. And so in this regard, uh, when it comes to our work at Civic as I'm researching, improving our research on, on people with disabilities in civic space, I saw a question already on this. To be honest, I think spaces like this, um, is, is what 
we're missing a little bit from our side, um, where we can engage with OPGs um, who have expertise. And I think, to be honest, our, our challenges are sometimes quite basic in, in terms of just making our materials accessible. Um, we know that our platform isn't um, particularly inclusive and has to be improved in this regard. Um, and so we absolutely need to draw on the expertise of organizations representing people with disabilities and, and working directly with people with disabilities to make sure that our research, our toolkits, our information on civic space on protecting our rights um, is accessible to everyone. So um, yes, spaces like this and continuing the conversation is um, very important. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. I've seen already a question from IDA, so you can jump on uh, in a moment. Augustina, would you like to still share uh, some experience you or challenges uh, you had in uh, working together with the social justice movement? And then we'll move to the questions. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, I, in fact, we experienced some challenges. Uh, uh, to mention some uh, uh, the negative attitude uh, due to uh, these attitudinal barriers, uh, the negative attitude of the society towards uh, uh, people with disabilities is one of the challenges that we are uh, going through. People uh, don't recognize that a disability is a cross cutting issue, and sometimes they take it that. Uh, uh, disability is a curse, and uh, as uh, so that the the, 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 the community uh, uh, sometimes they are not they are not ready to, to interact with persons with disabilities. Uh, they cannot accept a uh, social uh, disabilities even in social uh, gathering. Uh, yes, uh, these are some of the things that are, are, are in fact facing people with disabilities. And also the, the issue of uh, for Asia in South Sudan, uh, uh, the, 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 one of the challenges is maybe also uh, regional accommodation. Uh, for example, we have a diversity of, uh, of, of, of people with disabilities like uh, uh, the hearing impaired. Uh, we are lacking uh, interpreters. So, most of, uh, 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 of people with hearing impaired, they cannot, they cannot uh, access, they're not able to, 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 to interact with, uh, with, with the community. And this is also one of the risks. And uh, uh, so far they, 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 don't, they, they, don't, they don't get, uh, information about what is going on because of 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 the of the uh, lack of interpreters. So these kind of people are, are not in fact the they, they are not included in, in in the society. And one would be to see poverty sometimes is a also a risky because people he may see that people with disabilities he cannot contribute. And uh, uh, also uh, lack of capacity building is one of the challenges uh, because many people with disabilities are not informed about their, their, their rights in, in the society. So this also causes a, 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 a risk because they um, they are not able uh, to express uh, their, 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 their rights or their needs in the society. And uh, also uh, the problem, also one of the, the risks in especially here uh, in our communities, you see sometimes uh, South Sudan has been going uh, for a long years under conflict, and uh, still, uh, after now, there are still there are some communal conflict that are going along uh, in in our communities. So these are some of the risks sometimes that 
they cannot uh, expose uh, people with disabilities to, 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 in, to, in, to, to interact. If movement is also one of these because here some, uh, we are sometimes, uh, most of us, uh, we are confined within the centers. We are not able to go down to the, to the rural areas with our skirts uh, because of, uh, of the insecurity. And so these are some of the risks that are now uh, confine us not to, to to, 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 to interact with the, 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 the grassroots uh, communities and most of our of, 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 our, of the people with disability some of some some of them are, are, are in, in, in the in the rural areas so it is not easy uh, to meet them and uh, as I mentioned also uh, sometimes uh, Accessibility also is one of the of, of the challenges that sometimes uh, we are not able sometimes to access uh, some of the facilities and uh, also for the especially the, the, the those who are using have some sometimes the the, the 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 physical disability movement is a problem because of the distance so uh, they are sometimes left out in many occasions. Uh, yes, so these are the, are, are the challenges. So what we, after we need, we need to see that people with disabilities are given the, the, the opportunities, their capacity are built, they are empowered socially and economically so that they will be accepted in, 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 in the society. Thank so you. this is what I, I, can, I, can, I can put uh, as risks that are Thank you us. very much. Augustino. Uh, I would like to hand over to Jess uh, to uh, prompt us towards the question so we, we can start uh, our interaction. Jess. The hello, hello. Yeah, well, that's been a great set of presentations. Thank you very much, everyone, for, uh, for, for making them. We're now going to make this a little bit more interactive. It's just about me reading out questions from uh, the, the, the chat box. So I'm going to dive straight in um, and hopefully I'll kind of uh, represent them uh, uh, as well as I can. If I can't, then I'll probably ask you to put your mic on and, and just kind of give a bit more. The first one actually is from Camilla um, from IDA um, and she'd like to know um, how organisations like Civicus could partner with OPDs to improve uh, the research and data collection on uh, civic participation of persons with disabilities, and if you actually have faced any challenges in uh, reaching OPDs. So I'm gonna sling that one to, to uh, Deborah Chance there. Many thanks. Thanks, Jess. Um, yes, yeah, on the challenges, I'll start with that. Um, to be honest, a uh, challenge is just that we don't work with partners who um, specialize in this area, to be honest. We work with partners that are looking more at the regional. Um, and we need to do more, I think, to, as you say, partner with OPDs. Um, ways that we've done that before, um, not with people with disabilities, but producing information on refugees, for instance, is by creating thematic research where we partner with organizations um, working directly with refugees and with refugees themselves to produce research, understanding what the policies that um, are needed to make sure that they can fully exercise their civil rights um, and what are the specific challenges that they were facing. So we've done that with refugees and now we're trying to do that with youth. Um, and I think it is, uh, we're open to any feedback and partnerships to also be able to do that with people with disabilities. Um, and I think a, a, a general challenge to be honest is just to conduct research into account the different groups and the different challenges and the ways that um, we need to make sure that all of these different um, people are able to fully exercise their rights. That's brilliant, Deborah. Thank you very much for, for that response. Um, I'm going to uh, sling us on to the next question, actually, because the uh, as they're coming in, but do keep them coming in. That's really brilliant. Um, the next question actually is, is from um, uh, Adna Ayumna, who works for the MLR in Indonesia. 
Uh, many thanks for the question. This question actually is for all Justine, although it says uh, Mr. Jono, it, it is actually for uh, Augustino. So it's it's about the participation of PPOs in the civic space, uh, which obviously we've heard uh, they certainly isn't happening. Um, and therefore, um, have you got any uh, uh, insights um, prepared it, about in terms of strengthening um, how DPOs can actually be strengthened um, and how you actually deal with the issues of stigma within the space uh, and DPOs engaging? So, Christina, if you can respond to that, it would be brilliant. You're on mute at the moment if you're talking. Justina? I mean, I think this is probably a general question. Yes. You are there. Okay. Hi, Justina. Yes. You're okay to, to respond to that. Brilliant. Thanks. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, of course, I mentioned, I, I talk about the capacity building, but I have not mentioned some about education. Uh, in fact, we as a, as, as, as a, the network of persons with disabilities, we have been uh, lobbying for, for the signing of inclusive education policy because most of our, of our members with disabilities are not attending uh, classes. They are cut out because there is no inclusive policy. So we have been lobbying uh, for the signing of this, this policy. And now the policy is already being, being signed and it is going to be uh, disseminated uh, across the country so that any learner with disabilities are accommodated in any, any school like any, any child uh, because uh, in fact, one of the challenges here in South Sudan is the issue of, 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 of education and also uh, the modern technology. A few of us can, can access computer and uh, majority, in fact, uh, uh, cannot. So uh, this is all about the education the policy, inclusion policy so is already signed and we are going to, to disseminate across the, uh, the country so that any, any uh, learner with disabilities is absorbed without any, any, any hindrance. So this is what I wanted to talk, talk really about, about the issue of education here in South Sudan, for persons with disabilities particularly. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Justino. Um, and, and I think that's, I mean, very helpful insight indeed. Um, I, there's actually um, an interesting question here from Alison Marshall uh, from uh, Census National. And, and she's asking specifically for about any examples of successful alliances between OPDs and women's organizations working together. Um, particularly looking at things like sexual and reproductive health and rights. I'm guessing this is probably a good uh, question for Patina to answer if you're uh, uh, willing and able to, to respond to that one. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. And I would just like to give a concrete example of Nepal where we have worked with uh, Indigenous Women's uh, Consortium. The consortium consists of three national organization and also 84 uh, district uh, province and local chapters here in Nepal. And we as an organization of women with disabilities, we have worked uh, very closely with them, with the, uh, with the um, international instrument that is CEDA. So we have worked uh, the alliance in the CEDA and we have framed the issue of sexual health and reproductive rights and violence against uh, indigenous women and also particularly focusing on women with disabilities. And by doing the cross movement collaboration and also the networking and alliance with them, 
one of the very concrete examples that we have received in the concluding observation for the member states of Nepal in 2018 that clearly highlights about issues and challenges faced by uh, multiple and intersecting groups like uh, indigenous. It's not only indigenous, but the lead minority people and also women with disabilities. And that has open and avenues for us uh, to work in collaboration and not only in terms of preparing the report for, for the CEO report, but also working closely in collaboration with them, knowing about the challenges of women with mm -hmm. disabilities from their perspectives and also knowing about their perspective from our perspective. So now it has opened in avenues for us to work on the ground for the implementation of the CEDA. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Pratima. That's a very, uh, very practical uh, example there. Um, uh, hugely, hugely useful. Do keep your, your questions uh, coming. Um, we got a, 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 another question actually from Maria Shulman, uh, a fellow and a Cheshire uh, colleague. Um, Maria is asking specifically about um, education uh, being um, one of the most important vehicles for driving uh, societal uh, attitudinal changes. So, um, uh, Augustino, um, this question is more for you, but could you perhaps say a little bit more about the progress that's been made by um, SUDP, which is obviously the newest of the uh, of, uh, uh, DPOs uh, in uh, South Sudan um, in uh, driving inclusive education policy within South Sudan, Ministry of General Education? Uh, yes, I think uh, we, in fact, as a union of persons, it's a legal representative of people with disabilities. Even before the union uh, is formed, uh, we've been pushing for these policies, for example, the UNCRPD, national disability inclusion policy and also in uh, the inclusive uh, education policy. Uh, we have been lobbying uh, the ministry, particularly the ministry of our partners and the Ministry of Education to see that this policy is signed and, and ratified. Uh, so as uh, they have said sometimes, uh, some minutes ago, the, the policy is already, is already signed. And what remains is now uh, to be launched. And then after launched, uh, it will be uh, disseminated uh, across South Sudan to the, 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 the 10 states of South Sudan. Uh, even including the three administrative areas in South Sudan, uh, because this a, a policy in fact is a vehicle, as I've said before, uh, the, one of the challenges that we are not able uh, to participate fully, uh, it is because of uh, lack of, of education. As you see, is the long civil war in South Sudan, uh, it has interrupted even uh, the social and economic public in, in the country. And uh, mostly the people who are affected are persons with disabilities. So this is why we've been looking strongly that to see uh, that uh, the inclusion education policy is ratified so that any, any disability learner can join any school. Because here sometimes maybe we have only, we have one school that is the Jeff Education Center for the Blind, and we have started integrating a, a, our learners to the, to the, to the, the schools just here in Duba, in the capital city. But when you go down to the states, most of persons with disabilities, particularly the hearing impaired and the visual impaired, are not enrolled in schools. This is because 
there is no reasonable accommodation. There is no a sign language a, a, that a, they can teach us who are trained so that they can handle this a, learners with hearing impaired. Also, there is no there is no uh, no brain uh, in 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 the in the states. The only a few people learners with disabilities who are going to, to classes are, are here in Duba because of the existence of Rajab Education Center for the Blind that was established by Norwegian, uh, uh, Norwegian Association of the Blind and partially cited sometimes back. And that school has been upgraded into a primary school. So many learners with the visual impaired are trained there and we start to have integrated them to the ordinary school. But mostly uh, people, the teachers even cannot, are not ready to accept our learners with disabilities, particularly the visually impaired and the hearing impaired, because they say that they are not able to handle this surgery. So for the signing of this policy, and uh, I think it will be uh, included in the, in the education, in our education system of the country. So uh, this, I think, may pave way for learners with disabilities to, 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 to be enrolled in schools. So this is what I uh, believe I can say. Thank you. That's brilliant, Augustino. I just noticed in the chat box that uh, also the uh, South Sudan inclusive education policy is already signed. Um, yeah. And actually will be launched next month, which is really great. And congratulations, Billy, for you know kind of pushing that through. Very encouraging. Very encouraging. Okay, well, we're almost through with the questions, but there's one question actually from uh, which I think would be quite a, a good one to wrap up on from Ruby Holmes, who is a fellow co-coordinator on the um, OPD uh, partnership task group and also who helped together uh, with this, uh, this session. Um, so um, Ruby says, obviously, thank you very much for all your presentations. Um, um, and what are the recommendations to ensure that we are supporting the next generation of youth with disabilities in sex space? Really important question, Ruby. Thanks very much. Now, I'm kind of wondering who to, to, to give that to. My, my gut is to probably to ask uh, Deborah to, um, uh, speak to that, but also I think um, uh, Fatima, you you could usefully also uh, give a really good perspective uh, on that as well. So, who, who who's who's happy to speak to that first? Um, yeah, I can. Well, I can give two slides, I suppose. Um, we know from the from our research and civic space that you is among the groups that are often impacted, if only because. We know that youth often play a big role in, in protest movements, for instance, um, but also, of course, as human rights defenders themselves. Um, and so I feel like, at least from my side, um, we need to do a lot more to make sure that um, our movements are inclusive, that they're producing accessible materials, for instance, on people's rights so that um, people are able to learn about their rights in different ways. Um, I also know having been a youth activist that often um, human rights research or human rights um, advocacy itself is not really made for youth. Um, young people want to um, engage much more on activism and much more um, learn through videos, less through PDFs, that kind of thing. And so we need to make sure that um, our movements are, are catering to, to young people's demands and young people's uh, leadership, and particularly to young people with disabilities. Um, but I think I can learn a lot more from the other speakers on the panel about that as well. That's great. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Pratima, did you want to say, uh, just add briefly to, to what Deborah has been saying there? Yeah, just to add on on what, what Deborah has said. I just wanted to highlight that uh, what we have realized so far in the whole uh, disability movement, in the whole CSOs movement, one of the gap that we have highlighted about the single identity. So if we are framing in a single identity, that will not work. So we have to break the silos of the single identity 
within the box. And, and by saying that, I just wanted to highlight the, the gap of the whole CSOs movement, including the disability movement is, we have uh, not realized to build the synergy of intergenerational network, which is very crucial to bring young people with disabilities in, in with us. And by that, I would say that promoting and enhancing their um, leadership is very much crucial. But at the same time, I would also just want to highlight that young people uh, are very much advanced than us. The technology has made us in a very different mood, in a very different world. So realizing their issues, understanding their problems, understanding the challenges and understanding the way they want to do the advocacy is very much crucial. Otherwise, if we say that the advocacy that we have been doing and the advocacy that they need to be do, done, if we frame in that narrative, that will not work. So that is why we need to understand the values and also the challenges that youth are facing at this moment. We need to also provide a space that how do we enable young champions? So we need to build a space to create young champions so that they will be building allies and networks, not only within the disability movement, but within the overall marginalized and CSOs movement. This is what I wanted to add. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think that kind of brings us to the end of the questions. First of all, many thanks everybody who have um, uh, uh, added your questions to the to the chat boxes, and in particular, many thanks to uh, the willingness of all our panelists for uh, responding. I thought I'd just do a little um, uh, some summing up, really, really just four key points, and I'm going to be very quick, really. Um, so, I mean, firstly, obviously, you know, what we're hearing today is that we are looking at a shrinking space um, with, uh, in terms of the, the space, with increasing violations for freedoms and participation. So with that shrinking space, it's becoming much harder for um, uh, um, uh, minority voices, for the diversity of voices to actually come through. Um, and in uh, energizing, that civic space, we need, you know, uh, new groups to be able to emerge um, and, and, and engage, but there does need to be understanding from the social justice movement um, and the civic space, but there also needs to be increased confidence uh, by people with disabilities to actually engage in those um, spaces, very important. In terms of uh, challenges uh, of identity and power, um, this um, also requires a civic space to make room for intersectionality um, and giving greater diversity to the voices and uh, moving much more away from the, uh, the signal, uh, the, the single identity um, and that kind of homogenous kind of group, you know, recognizing diversity, encouraging and making spaces for much more uh, 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 voices. And in terms of uh, there are an awful lot of opportunities that were were raised, I think uh, the one that resonated with me most um, was really uh, something that Augustino, uh, I think, said, which was that uh, in terms of looking at the future, you know, it really does require an awful lot of wisdom um, in order to uh, uh, redress the imbalance of power and wisdom, you know, on all levels from all sides. Um, I, I think it's been a really, really helpful um, an enlightening uh, session today, and uh, a big thanks to everybody. I'm now going to hand back actually to Marika to um, uh, to, to close the session and to, to give thanks. But many thanks. To you for me. Thanks a lot, Jazz. So uh, after this great summary, all that is left for me is to say thank you. First of all, thank you to the IDDC. Um, membership and especially the Secretariat for making this webinar uh, possible. Uh, you are behind the scenes and I know you do a lot that we don't necessarily notice. Also, thank you to Karen, Ruby, Jazz and uh, uh, task groups for organizing this, but most of all, thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Agostino. Thank you, Seta. And thank you, Pratima. It's been great uh, to uh, share um, and for you to share your experiences with you. 
I've learned a lot and I've I was very inspired and I have the feeling from the chat and the questions that others were as well. For everybody, a lovely evening, lovely and um, thanks for joining us today. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye bye. Stay well. You too. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Cool.